As I mentioned before, we're moving on in our series, Live Like This. And we're walking through the best sermon ever preached by the best, best preacher who ever lived. Just a reminder of the setting of where we are. I know we took a week off here to, to where we are. Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry. He is teaching and preaching and healing and casting out demons and all of these things. And he's walking. He's called his disciples to himself, his apostles. And he is going with large crowds now behind him as people are marveling at what he is doing. And as he's walking along, he takes a moment to stop, go up on to a hill to what would provide an amphitheater for him and to proclaim truth to people. And he begins teaching. And it would be this moment that would change Jesus from everything else and everyone else that you know and everything that they knew as well. It would be this moment where he would teach his people, the Jews. They were all Jews following him. And as they were walking with him, he would teach them and turn everything on top of its head. This would be the moment where he would spark the ire of the, the religious leaders of the day who would start from this point on to watch him closely, to sift through what he says with a fine tooth comb and send him to the cross ultimately to die. This would be the message that causes that. It's more than likely the message that he preached as he went around the countryside. Different variations of this, but this is the message that he would preach in parts of it. And I want to remind you the key of it, all the way back to message number one. This is message number five. The key of this whole sermon is not to hear it and apply it to your life as an ethical standard. You can do that. And if you do, you will most certainly be a good person. But the key is to look into your heart, the real you, the true part of you, the part that nobody else knows but you, not your spouse, not your best friend, not your kids, your grandkids. None of them really know the true you. But what Jesus says is when your heart is flowing forth in me, then you're proving who the true you is. That's the key of the Sermon on the Mount. You're proving whether you are of God or not of God. And Jesus makes a bold claim in our scripture today about that. And we're going to talk about it. There's a lot of verses that we have to go through. I told you we're in the middle of six antitheses. We went through anger, lust, divorce today, oaths, retaliation, and how to deal with your enemies are the last three before Jesus switches to a different subject. So we're smack dab in the middle. We just ended a great message on divorce two weeks ago, divorce and remarriage. Amazing message, one of the best I've ever heard. And uh, we're looking forward to walking into what God has to say for us today. So I wanna ask you this question just to frame up your thoughts of where these people are. Do you, or have you memorized sometime in your life, or do you know the Ten Commandments? Can you quote them? If you can't quote them, do you know what they are? You may not be able to do it in order, but you know what the Ten Commandments are in general. You probably should because they're very important. Even though they're Old Testament, they're part of our lives today. They're part of this law of God. And the Bible clearly tells us that it is the law of God that shows us our sinful condi condition. Our relationship to God is severed because we cannot keep his perfect law. That's his perfect law. But today, as you memorize, you memorize those, if you don't, then here's your challenge. The people of this day memorized them. It was part of their lifestyle. It's what they did. It wasn't an option. Likewise, it should be the same for a Christian to know the word, because he talks about it, right? But they not only had 10, they had took it and skewed it so far that we're in the 600s of commandments. And Jesus is talking about those in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And you see, what I want to show you today is how well they skewed things and how well we today can look at them and go, oh, they're terrible because they skew it and mess it all up. No, 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 no. We're very good at skewing them as well. So I'm going to give you some pointers and some tips through all of this passage, and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about how we can apply this to our lives and what it really looks like in the life of a believer. Because the goal of the Sermon on the Mount is to show you if you're in Christ or not. And if you are in Christ, is to show you are you living like it or not. 
Are you proving that you are in Christ? That's the whole goal of it. So as we, as we dive into our scriptures, if you have it with you, it's Matthew chapter number five, verse 33. We're gonna, again, we're gonna cover a bunch of verses. I've got them all for you on the screen. If you wanna look on the screen or on your tablet or smartphone or whatever it is, Jesus is switching from the vertical to him in your heart to the horizontal, to our relationships. How do you deal with other people? How do you maneuver your life? And how do you deal with people who do things to you? And how do you do things to people? That's what he's talking about here. So we begin with oaths in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 through 37. Again, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old. He's talking about Leviticus 19. You shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, flipping it on its head, that's what the rabbis were teaching. Jesus flips it on its head. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. What an easy illustration. <laughs> Let what you say, verse 37, be simply yes or no. Anything else comes from evil. Again, Jesus is directly quoting Leviticus 19, but he's also relating to, and Leviticus 19 is looking to, the third commandment of the Ten Commandments. You know what it is? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, you see, the scribes and the rabbis of the day vehemently taught against swearing in the name of the Lord because of this third commandment. Do not swear by God. Do not swear by anything like that. In fact, it is because of that that I grew up in a God-fearing home, that I grew up hearing those words. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That includes saying JC. Don't say GD, don't say JC, don't say any of it. Because we do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, directly stemming from where this is. It goes a lot deeper than that, but that is true. We can do it in many different forms. It doesn't have to be the actual words, but we're swearing to God. And see, they took it and skewed it just like we took it and skewed it as well. We came up with great ways to conveniently say these things, right? To take the name of the Lord in vain, if you will. But see, they were teaching that taking an oath brings credibility to your life. And this is what Jesus is directly talking about. See, they were teaching that because of what it says here, you are not to take any oath to God, but if you want someone to believe what you're saying, then you have to say this. I'm going to do this for you, I swear on my life. That's how they would do it, they skewed it. I'm going to do this for you, I swear on my house. I swear on that tree, I swear, whatever it is. And Jesus responds to them and says, I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, because that's where God is, or by anything on this earth that God has created because it's his footstool. And so he says, don't swear by the city of Jerusalem because it's the capital city. Don't swear by the government. Don't swear by any of it. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. You see, Jesus is telling them, this is so much more than swearing on something. See, you've took a law and you've misapplied it by putting something else in its place. Remember, we talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount where we insert pride. A lot of us, we all do. We insert pride where we removed a sin. We insert pride. Well, look what we did. Look what we did. That's what they're kind of doing here. You say, we take this in a modern context and we skew it as well. Some people will literally look at this passage and take it so literal that it means that you should never swear an oath. What do I do if I've been called to go to court and testify and I have to place my hand on the Bible and swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. I'm swearing to God and I'm swearing on the Bible. Can I do that? Because he said, don't take no oaths at all. What do I do if I'm taking an oath of office? Do I take the oath? Do I swear to uphold the office to the best of my integrity and ability? What do I do? See, we take that and we make it all confusing. That's not what Jesus was saying here. 
Jesus is talking about them using oaths to bring credibility to their name or credibility to what they were saying. He is not speaking of, and I have no problem with swearing on the Bible and testifying or swearing an oath of office or any of these oaths. My thing is this, be careful what you swear an oath to, for sure, for sure, don't swear an oath to anything, but he's talking directly about swearing an oath to say you're going to do something. Because the Old Testament law taught if you swear to God and you don't come through with it, then your debt is going to be required of you. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. His point is not about getting rid of oaths. It's about being a man or a woman of your word. Your word is who you are. And as a Christian, your word should be binding. You should not have to swear on God or swear on your hair that you can't even control if it stays in or comes out or it turns white or it turns black. You can dye it, but you still know them roots are gonna come out, ladies. And here's the deal, or men too, I don't know. But you can do all the things you want to to mask it, but the truth is the truth. It's about your heart. It is what it is. So the person who loves God with all of their heart and loves their neighbor as themselves, which is the greatest commandment of all, Jesus said, speaks truth from their heart. You see, what he's saying is godly people are known for their truthfulness because they realize that God is omniscient and he's sovereign. And he realized this, and this is what you need to know today about this point, about every point, is that there is no thought, there is no words that come from, there are no words that come from your mouth. There's not a thought that goes through your mind. There's not an action that you do or don't do that does not go before God Almighty. God knows everything about you. Stop trying to hide from him. He knows it all. And it's all about your heart. And you've got to change your heart and your mind because nothing goes unnoticed before him. So you live for his glory and for his honor and that's what he's saying. A person's, a godly person's yes means yes, and their no means no. Be a man or be a woman of your word. Then he takes it a step further in another antithesis about retaliation in Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. Let's read it together. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You've heard that before, right? But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. What? But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from, me, from you. So he goes a little step further and I'm gonna say it to you like this. What do you do when someone does you wrong, what have you done in the past? How do you respond? Do you get even, which is your natural response? More than likely, that's your first thought. God says your heart is being changed. Jesus is saying your heart is being changed from inward out. And because of that, when someone does you wrong, you respond differently. You see, he uses an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which meant He's talking about what they called the lex talionis. The lex talionis was something in the judicial system of the day. And what that meant was equal and fair punishment. And he says, when you've heard it said this, God instituted lex talionis because it was instituted for fair punishment. If, just to use a simple example, if you were to cut the hand off of someone, you would go be judged in court for it. And what would be required of you? Your hand, not your life, but your hand, because it would be an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, a tooth for a tooth. And it was set in place so that you would not go in and overbear, because that's our normal reaction. If you do me wrong, I'm coming at you with the force of forces. To get even, actually, I'm probably going to go farther than get even. I'm going to get what's mine. That's what it's against. But... Again, they had skewed it in that day. They had skewed it from the civil system to their personal relationships. This is not meant for personal relationships, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's meant for the civil system. 
In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, would, would tell us in Romans 12 that it's not even our job as Christians to try to get even. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And God repays justly, and you will skew it just like they did, is what Jesus is saying. But he gives four illustrations real quickly in there to help us understand. The first one is the slap on the cheek. If anybody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Bet me. Bring it. Let's go. Anybody want to slap me? Let's have a slap fest up here. You know what I'm saying? That's where I'm at with this. But Jesus says, if anybody slaps you on the cheek, now what are you thinking? You thinking we're squared up with our dukes? Has anybody seen that? It's on social media, YouTube or something. Seen them people and they grab on. It's not it's like arm wrestling benches, but they slapping each other. Have you seen that? And you get slapped as hard as you can. And you watch them people and they go, wham! And they'll just go, fall out. It's just stand there and tense up as bad as you can and get slapped. If you ain't seen that and you're on the internet sometime, <laughs> Google slap competitions. It's crazy. But here's the deal. He's not talking about that where you're squared up to one another. You got to look into what Jesus is saying. He says, if anyone slaps you, turn the other cheek. He uses the same term here that is used when Jesus is being beaten and mocked during his trial, during his persecution, and he's going to the cross. In that passage of scripture, it says they beat him. They whipped him with the cat of nine tails. They did all of those things to him, and some of them even slapped him. What it means is a backhanded slap. It's not squaring up and let's duke it out. It means a backhanded slap. It's not even relating to physicality here, per se. It's relating to someone who hurts you emotionally, Someone who does something wrong to you and it kills you because they have slapped you with a backhand. They have come at you like this. If they're coming at you to hurt you physically, they're coming at you like this. But if they're coming at you to hurt you emotionally, they're coming at you like this. And that's what Jesus was talking about. He's saying if someone comes and hurts you emotionally or relational pain, and all of these things say slap Jesus, and they slap you emotionally or relationally, you're just to turn the other cheek. Now that is hard to do. Because what do you want to do? You want to hurt them back. You hurt me, so I hurt you. And emotional hurt sometimes is 10,000 times worse than physical, isn't it? It lasts for a long time. And you see, here's another way they skewed it around, right? Then he talks about litigation. He talks about doing what requires of you when you're sued. So if they're sued, then what would be required of them, and they ask for the tunic, that would be their, inter, their inner garment that touches their skin, then he says, give them your tunic. You see, the tunic was what they used for currency in those days. They traded tunics. They made them and traded them. And as they traded them, they would barter and do things and buy stuff with them. And that's what the tunic, it was, it was a very important part of their garment, but also a very important garment for money, for currency. And he says, if they sue you for your tunic, give it to them, but also give them your cloak. The cloak was the outside of the tunic. Now, this was revolutionary because you don't give nobody your cloak because your cloak was even used for bedding. It was the most prized possession that you had. It was used in many functional ways. You could ride on it, like use it as a blanket on a donkey. You could do any, or a camel. You could do any of these things, right, with a cloak. Even the law in the Old Testament said, if you take everything from a man, do not take his cloak, because you, that is his most prized possession. Do not take his cloak. Jesus says, give them your cloak too if they sue you. Then he goes on to say, go the extra mile. You see, in their day, he says, if they require you to go a mile, then go a mile. But then, let's go another mile. Let me explain that to you. What they would know that is this. These are Jewish people. They're under the control of the Roman Empire. So all the Roman guards and soldiers that are around could at any time tap you on the shoulder and say, carry my stuff. And you had to do it. The Jews absolutely hated this law. Wouldn't you? You'd be like a slave. You're driving down the road or walking down the road. They tap you on the shoulder. You have to do this. You're bound by law to go a mile or also known as 1,000 paces. 
Jesus said, go your required 1,000 paces. But then at the end, look at that soldier, look at that Roman person, and go another 1,000. Go from obligation, what's required of you, go from there to serving this person. Go from obligation to compassion and help this person out. You see, he's blowing this thing up, isn't he? All of this is saying, I am here to be served. But the gospel says, because I have been served by God, I now serve you. That's what the life of a Christian is about. And Jesus is flipping everything they know on their head because you and I are really, really good at coming up with these laws just like they were and we put ourselves in this pretty box and this is what a Christian looks like and we put it in the box and as long as we live in the box and we don't break that one and if we do, our, our box has been a little bit but praise God for grace, we can come back in and he's gonna meet us there and we're back in our little box. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I came to set you free and he who the Son sets free is free indeed, out of the box. Jesus said, take away your box. It's all about your heart. It's about how you live now. Stop putting these extra things on it. Go with God in your heart. Your heart, if you are in God, is the Holy Spirit working through you, and you will know what's truth, and you will know what's false if you take heed to what he says and listen to what he says and put it in your heart and guard your heart against evil. He goes on with a fourth example that says, be ready to help anyone in need. Now, real quickly, what he's talking about here is helping legitimate people in need, that we should be always ready to serve people in need. He's not saying to serve the lazy. He's not saying to serve the people who it's going to hurt them if you serve them, or it's going to make them even worse, users or abusers of the system. He's not saying that. He's saying legitimately help people in need. You see how I know that is because he's talking to Jews. And when you talk to Jews, you talk about begging, they ain't about it. And I'm not either. I ain't looking for a beg session. Are you? Our pride is simply higher than that. And when he told them, he said, I'm talking a legitimate need. In all of this, he says, don't ask yourself what's in it for me. What can I get out of it? But ask what's in it for God? It's for his glory in all things. Now, I want to say a note here before we go on to the third and final antithesis. I believe that Christians are the strongest of all people. I believe they are because they know the truth and they stand on the truth. I'm not talking about you wavy Christians that are here today and gone tomorrow. When the storm comes, you look like you're a wreck. I'm talking about those people who stand on God no matter what comes, right? You know what I'm talking about. Those people, when they're in their lives, you can see God moving in them. They're the strongest. Jesus is not telling us here, and we're smart enough to know this, right? Jesus is not telling me here, let you beat me up. Let you come in my house, take whatever you want. Jesus is not saying, you come in my house tonight, you're gonna meet a force. Just gonna be letting you know that. If you decide to show up where I live, you're gonna be met with a force. And Jesus is not saying, don't, Practice self-defense. Don't be on guard. He's not saying that. He's saying our inner response is totally different than everyone else's. He's talking about our relationship to each other. Listen, if it warrants you pressing charges against that person through the legal system, it warrants it. Paul himself, the apostle, warns against us suing brothers and sisters in Christ because he wants us to do what? follow Christ's example, and work it out between ourselves. But sometimes that's not possible. And you go to far lengths as you can go and you still got to sue them, sue them. But do it in a godly way. He's not saying these things. As far as it be from you, do all that you can to make it work. But if you can't, there is a legal system in place. And it's based off the lex talionis. And use it to get what is yours rightfully. But what he's saying is don't apply the civil system to your relationships. Now, I hope that makes sense to you today. Christians are not to be rollover doormats. I believe that we're in the situation we are with a lot of things because we get this loving people thing so mixed up today that we have to love people at all costs that we let them walk over top of us. You're not gonna walk over top of the truth. 
You may walk over top of me, but I draw the line when you walk over the top of God's truth. Amen? And today, that is what Jesus is saying. And that's what we need to get through in our heart. It's all about what God wants to do through us for his glory. But then he goes on, to love your enemies. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? You've got your reward. People who love you, you love them back. It's really easy to do. What do you have? That's your reward. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? The worst of the worst. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Again, he's talking to Jews. And they thought Gentiles were trash. And he's like, you're acting like the people you think's trash if you do this. Do they not act just like you? So what he's saying here to, to you and I is this. He's quoting, love your neighbor as yourself, which is in the law. But tell me this. If you go back to verse 43 and you say, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Tell me in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where you can find that. It does not exist. The only place that I could find in my search for anywhere that we are to go against our enemies would be in David's imprecatory prayers in Psalms, where he prays evil on his enemies. But that is not David's overall lifestyle. That's just when he was in these certain places and God was guiding him in his life. His lifestyle was not against his enemies for his own self-pleasure. His lifestyle was against his enemies for God's glory, right? So this is not in the Bible. So Jesus is taking something they had taken, you shall love your neighbor, and they've skewed it, and they've added, and hate your enemy, the scribes and the rabbis. You see, as they added that to it, it is human error, because you think that's the natural thing. If you love your neighbor, then naturally I hate my enemies. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. Actually, Jesus goes further, and he says in verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When's the last time you prayed for the person you hate most? And maybe you don't hate anybody, but there's somebody there. Listen, that person you don't like. When's the last time you prayed for them? Jesus is flipping this whole thing on his head because he says when you pray for them, you take them before the throne of God, the very place where justice and righteousness exists. And only God can judge rightly. See, it's your intention to swell up inside. And it's your intention to get even. And it's your intention to say, they did me wrong. I write them off and I am done with them. But it's God's intention for you to take that to him for more than one reason. He says that because it is your goal to take all people before God, yes, but it's also releasing for you. Harboring bitterness and hate in your lives creates a sad and bitter person. And I know some sad and bitter people because of things that have happened in their life. But last week, we saw people stand up here and quote to you, and I tell you, the orphan system in Romania is totally different than in America, and quote to you, I never thought I had a family, and I never thought I would have one, and I wondered why God would even allow me to be created. But they still trusted God, was their testimony, and God delivered them to this Finding Hope Ministries. If they can do it, how can I even do so? How could their parents not be their enemies? Be my enemies. I am, my, I am how I am because that's how my dad is. I act like him. I'm just a knock off the old block, chip off the old block. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's all about changing your heart inside and turning how that is. So it actually means love your enemies. And he says, if you do this, verse 45, you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Wait, 
Did Jesus just say, if you love your enemies, then that's how you know if you're saved? That's what it looks like. That's not what he said. He says, you're proving that you are a son or daughter of God. Because this is how God loves. He sends rain to the people that hate him, and he waters their crops. And he sends rain to the people that love him, and he waters their crops. And he allows their plants to grow in farming categories. He provides for people who hate him today. He provides for atheists. He provides for people who live a lifestyle outside of God's provision. It is called common grace. He provides for all of his creation. He provides for the evil and he provides for the good in his common grace. And in the same way, we are to live in this life as well, just like he does. And you say, when you do that, it actually means that you are proving yourself. So I'm gonna tell you this today. The only reason you live for God, I hope, is because God has saved you. Amen? You don't live for God because of your mom or your dad first. I do somewhat, but not first. I don't live for God because I'm supposed to, because it's my job, because I have to look this way or I have to do this thing. I don't live for God because my friends do it, so I look like them. I live for God because he saved me. And if I live for God because he saved me, then I live for his glory and his glory alone before all things. And what is your number one goal as a Christian? To live for his glory. And how do you live for his glory? You live for his glory by growing up in Christ. Paul says, the apostle Paul says, God forbid that any of you get saved and just go to church. That's how I paraphrase it. And look the part of a Christian. He says, God forbid that you, any of you get saved by the grace of God and you stay on the milk of the word and require to be bottle fed the rest of your life. He says the goal of your life is that you get saved and you move from milk to meat and you grow up and you become strong and you become a strong follower of Jesus Christ. And if that is your goal, and that is your goal in itself, then I tell you today, that should be it. And this is the statement. How you love your enemies is one of the greatest barometers of how mature you are in Christ. I don't care if you're a deacon, a preacher, singing the choir, the praise team, you look good. This is one of the best barometers. What a challenge, right? How you love the people who do you wrong. Jesus is very clear. You're going to prove that you're in my family if you do this. So what do we do with all of these things? How do we maneuver? How do we apply these to our lives? Well, I've got some notes here. I know this has been like a lecture, but here's what I want to tell you. You have to know yourself. And so if you know yourself and how I deal with people, take inventory of your life. There may be nobody in your life that you're, you hate. I can't think of anybody I hate, to be honest. I know people that don't like me for whatever reason. I can't think of anybody. I know people that I don't really like to be around. But I can't think of anybody I hate. I'm not, I wasn't brought up to hate. I don't have any problems with this. Au contraire. We've been proven wrong, haven't we, through Jesus' teaching, through all of this, through this lust, anger, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and number six, love your enemies. Put it all together and take inventory of your life and see where you are and notice the condition of your heart. And that's how we apply it. So as we're getting ready to shift into a next section of pious living next week, here's where we need to get firm before we can even go on. First, you've got to stop right now and you've got to be honest with yourself about yourself. Be honest with yourself about yourself if you're going to be able to do any of this living for God. Listen to the words of Paul the Apostle in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, as I read them to you. When we were utterly helpless, utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. 
Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Praise God. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, read this line with me, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. My friend, you've heard the phrase, I'm nothing but a sinner saved by the grace of God. And that's a true phrase, but it robs a lot of the power from your life. I know who I am. I am a sinner. And while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. He took those sins, my past, present, and future sins, to the cross. And all I had to do was receive him, ask him, pray that he would be Lord of my life, and understand this sacrifice that he made. But I understand knowing that who I am. And I, being honest with myself, know that I, and just like everyone else, removed from the grace of God. Without God, where would you be today? Without God, would you be on this straight and narrow path that you are on currently? Without God, would you be on the wide and destructive path? Without God, would you be marching down the streets in pride? Without God, would you be in the situation of where you're justifying your lifestyle apart from God? Without God, would you be justifying these things, this anger, this lust, this divorce, you would be doing it and justifying it easily. But with God, the truth of God has been implanted into your life and into my life. So if I'm honest with myself about myself, it gives me the base starting point of where we are. And when you're honest with yourself about yourself, only then can you deal with other people. And speaking of other people, secondly, It's time for you, after you get honest with yourself, to be real about other people and with other people. It's time for you to be real about the condition of other people and with other people. You see, Jesus ended this section with verse number 48. And he said this, you be perfect as I am perfect. Huh? I I read that, to be honest with you, and I was like, what? You be perfect? I'm far from perfect. If anybody knows that, it's me. But we look into the word perfect there, and Jesus says, perfect is is not perfect in the sense that you're thinking. It is to be complete, to be whole, to be mature in Christ, to be growing up. There will be a day when everything will be made right and we will be perfect and we will be with our perfect God. But that day, as we're working to it today, we are working to that day and we can experience some of that completeness now. And that's why Paul urged you to get off the milk of the word and get into the meat of the word and grow in God for you and for no one else and for his glory alone. And that's why Paul urged us to do so. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, complete, whole, and mature. So if you're real about yourself and you're real about other people, then you can look at yourself and say, but if it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be where I am today. And God, I pray that your grace would intervene in her or his life. Because what they did to me proves that they are out of your will or they are not living their life in your glory or in your power. And my friends today, that is the key. To see the situation, to see the people for who they are. And if you can be honest about yourself, you can be honest and real about their condition. Can you see people the way God sees people? 
That's a hard question. So we understand this, that being perfect then is living your story by the grace of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So I tell you today, you may look at my life from the outside and you will say, well, Luke grew up in this thing, so it's all he knew. He grew up in church, on the pew. It's all he knew. So at a young age, Luke did the thing. He made the decision, got saved, got baptized. That was Luke's decision. Then you might look at my life when I was 23, spiraling out of control, running from the call of God on my life, running from the will of God in my life, trying to figure everything out on my own, controlled by lust, envy, greed, gluttony, all of these things, controlled by the deadly sins, whatever you wanna call them. And you can say Luke decided his life's being derailed, so he made a decision to study God and know God for who he was and know why he knew God and not know God because Mother Teresa, that's my mom's name, that's what I call her, not because Mother Teresa taught me, not because Gary, my dad, taught me, but I want to know God because Luke knows God. Because I can't get on living on my mama's faith for long. And I can't get on living on my daddy's faith for long. I got to live on my faith that is given to me in God. And you could look from the outside and you could say that Luke just decided to make this decision and turn over this leaf. You can look in my life and you say, Luke decided to get married to Katie a few years later because that was the decision to make because everybody was doing it around him. You know how it goes. Everybody gets married. And every, when the cousins start getting married, everybody gets married. When everybody has babies, everybody has babies, all those things. You can look and say, you made that decision or Luke made that decision. And that's how everybody in the world looks at it. You can look and say, when Luke messed up really bad and he did this thing, whatever it is, and he hurt that person. And you can look and say, well, that's just Luke. Or you can say, Luke made a decision in that moment to try to never do that again and to try to make peace with that person because he just wants to be a good person. You could do that. Or you could say, Luke made all of these decisions because it was God working through everything he did. Everything good, everything bad, because he was bringing me back to him. He was bringing me back to him. And you could say and look to me today, and you could say, all of grace is my story. All the way from now, from earth to glory, as the song says. You can look to me and say that the reason I'm standing here today is because my story, my journey, your journey is all about living in the grace of God. It's by grace through faith I am standing here today. It's by grace through faith that he brought me into himself as an eight-year-old, as a 15-year-old, as the benchmarks in my life, as he brought me to him as a 23-year-old spiraling out of control. He brought me to him when I got married. He brought me to him when I had kids. He keeps bringing my situations back to him. And it's all because of his grace. And my friends, the only thing that separates me from the worst person that's in your mind right now, that person that keeps doing evil and that person that keeps doing wrong and they keep shaming God and they keep doing these things, the only thing that separates you is grace from being where they are. So that's how we live, in the grace of God. Paul was so strongly in favor of this, that in Romans chapter nine, he said this about his Jewish friends who didn't believe. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, take away my salvation if it would save them. That's how much he wanted them to know this grace of God. How much do you want them to know this grace of God. We're talking about your enemies. We're talking about your loved ones. We're talking about all of that. Is it enough to understand and live in the power of grace? Are you willing to go that far? That's a tough statement. So we understand in all of this that living free then is releasing yourself and others to God. To truly live free is to release yourself to God. Because when you release yourself to God, then you see his power. And when you release others to God, you see his power and it's for your good. You see, when you take everything to his throne, everything, everything to an almighty God who's omniscient, omnipresent, who knows all things, 
doesn't matter if it's your enemy or if my son right now who's dealing with a health issue on his foot, big old nasty blister, and it hurts me. But I trust God with, him, with you as much as I trust God with that person who's done me wrong. That is living free. That's what Jesus came to allow us to do. What a challenge these antitheses have been, haven't they? It's all about your heart. None of you are free from guilt, but all of you are empowered by grace. So are you living defeated because it ain't going right or they're not turning to God? Or are you living upright in the truth and power of God and his grace? Because the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. This kind of living is the one that flows from the poor in spirit, the meek. This kind of living is the where those blesseds fit in. This kind of living is how you become salt and light in the world, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's stand together as we pray. God, we thank you for these moments together in your word. We thank you for this message and how bold it's been in my life. I pray that it would lodge in our hearts. Holy Spirit, my prayer today is that you would move in people's lives and that you would do a work. You would show them where they need you, where they need your grace, and they need to see your grace, and they would, you would show them how to live. God, there's people in many different situations in this room today that have been called out of darkness into light, and they have been called to be darkness and light. And so today, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would empower them, empower us, to stop being so anemic, but be in the power of God as we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.